Hey there, welcome back to the podcast. This is Phil. This is the Holy Post Podcast. I am here with a large gaggle of people today to have some fun. I'm here with Sky Jatani. Hi, Sky. Hi, Phil. How are you? I, I've good. been better. I've You're been good. better. Yeah. <laughs> Christian Taylor is back with us. Hi, Christian. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you party people. <laughs> and we also have a special guest to join in because uh, we got some fun stuff to talk about and we invited her back. Caitlin Shuss, all the way from Dallas. Yes. Hey, from Dallas. Uh, the author of the liturgy, the liturgy of politics. We had her on, what, three weeks ago? Three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Big hit, very popular episode. <laughs> And now that her book is out and it's breaking all records for a first time mm. still in <laughs> seminary author, uh, we thought we would have her back because of the topic. So uh, with that in mind, here's a theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Christian. Okay, uh, we're back. Sky is grumpy because we were trying to record with a new technology and everyone's computers were cooperating except Sky's, which would not let him join. I so. kept failing the health check. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to upgrade our audio quality for remote recording. And Sky's computer said, nope, <laughs> no, you're not. Uh, and that's okay. It's okay, Sky. You we'll don't figure it to, out. We'll you don't have to feel out. bad, Sky. You don't I'll, I'll, have to. I'll put my computer on a diet, lose a few pounds. It doesn't reflect poorly on you. Mm hmm. Very much. And is Alfie in the room with you? He is. He's hiding behind the chair over there. He may or may not be dead. Yeah. I think he got uncomfortable with the level of hostility that you were starting to display toward your computer. And he, he couldn't quite tell that it wasn't about him. <laughs> okay. Um, the reason that uh, we, well, we have, first of all, we have David French back on special episode with David French, Sky and David French talking gun control. Woo. I can't wait to hear that interview. Yeah. I, 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 I got to I got to say up front. I mean, well, I'll do an introduction for him in a minute, but yeah. I listened to the interview again and I had repeatedly that moment of, Oh, I wish I should have said this or I oh. could have said that. But in the moment, he's just so smart. <laughs> and so, so harvard do you feel that you were bested do you oh have clearly <laughs> clearly like I, I i after the fact i had all kinds of great things i wanted to say but this is witty retorts well he's just so well versed on the topic and yeah. far more than i am but yeah. i admit it but anyway it's a good conversation and i thought he did he did a fantastic job and it was very thoughtful well if you were a, a true youtube personality you would then take your interview with him and then do a youtube video overlay of you pausing it to say the things that you wish you had said and then we would all say oh sky is is witty and bright yeah, I guess at that point, though, we would never have uh, David French back as a guest. Yeah, <laughs> so I guess that's, I'd rather that's, keep him in the that's probably the in the good graces of the Holy Post. OK, so something happened um, last week that uh, kind of caught everybody off guard. A lot of people online have either said um, profanities or said that their first thought was a profanity. And that is that uh, it was announced that uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died on Friday. Uh, actually, David French wrote about it over the weekend and said, on Friday afternoon, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, and I have never in my adult life seen such a deep shudder and sense of dread pass through the American political class. Uh, he says, we knew a polarized and divided nation was about to endure yet another sharp escalation in the culture war, and this escalation could well lead to a cascading series of events that could strain the constitutional and cultural fabric of the nation. That seems like strong language. So anyway, let's first of all, first of all, what were your thoughts about hearing about the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Very famous uh, uh, liberal, you know, lion on, on the court. Sky, let's start with you. I don't think I can share what my first thought was. In on a family program in like the this. moment, and then your first thought in the moment, but yeah. Then, and then when you thought about her, just give us a general your general impression of her. Uh, I, I, I deeply respected her, 
you, you, obviously there isn't a justice on the court whose decisions I all uh, always agree with, yeah. but I thought she handled herself with incredible dignity and courage throughout her career. And was, she was a pioneer in yeah. fighting for a lot of rights for women. And, um, and even, you know, some justices have been a bit more acerbic than others and some have been more political than others. And she seemed to always stay above that. And I, I actually really respect the fact that one of her closest friends was Antonin Scalia, who right. was her right. ideological opposite. And the two of them got along and their families apparently got along really, really well. And I think that she modeled what it means to be an ideological American who doesn't think those on the other side are, are demonic. Right. And we need more of that. And she, and she was, she had a great sense of humor and was witty and brilliant. And it's a loss for the country, which doesn't begin to address what it means for this political moment, which is a whole nother yeah. nightmare. And I, I really wish that she had held out for a couple of weeks or months longer. But Okay. Christian, did you have, uh, you, you, you came of age, you and I cut our teeth uh, at the, the second half of the Reagan revolution and so when she came along, we were pretty much, you and I were full on in culture war mode. And, you know, we have to take back the Supreme Court and, and progressives are ruining America. So, you know, if since we're the same age, you, you probably had a, have had an initial negative response, you know, to, to the arch liberals on the court, which is, I assume, has moderated a bit over the years. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I remember, you know, standing up against her nomination and not wanting her to be appointed. And uh, but my opinion really has changed over time. And like Sky said, she really earned my respect in the way that she approached those that disagreed with her. And she was a, an incredible woman. And I respected her greatly. When I heard she had passed, I was very sad. And uh, I knew I, I thought she kept beating this cancer thing, you know, uh, not too long right. ago, she said, I'm going to work, you know, I'm doing fine. And I really believed that and thought, great, we're going to make it through this year. And that's not going to be another big thing that happened. So I was actually caught off guard with that. And I will say I hung my head like this when I heard the news and then just, uh, just shook it because I knew the storm was coming. But I have to say, the thing that I was most surprised about and thankful for was Trump's initial reaction. And I want to give him credit for that. Um, when he stepped off the stage, I really felt that was a genuine moment where he said she was a great person and mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hear that. So I was thankful for that response from him. Yeah, it's, it's helpful to at least start out with, with some empathy. Okay, Caitlin, you, you know, you're not old enough to even... <laughs> Is she voting yet? <laughs> yeah, <are> you, <laughs> have you voted yet? No, we're kidding. Uh, you, you have, an, uh, I think, an unusual aptitude for reading politics and speaking into that. So I wanted to have you on just to get your impression. You know, you're a Liberty kid. You're a Dallas Theological Seminary kid. You just published a book about politics. Uh, what was your impression growing up of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and has it changed over the course of your life as you've you know, grown and learned more? Honestly, I don't remember thinking very much about her before, um, but honestly, I mean, she when she kind of became, you know, notorious RBG, the big icon thing, I was first becoming interested in politics, and I still grew up in a conservative home, so I wasn't really attached to that. She was like the feminist that was bad. But pretty quickly, I mean, not only learning about her position in the Supreme Court now, but more importantly, I think the work she did before that, which was to kind of slowly go through instances of discrimination on the basis of gender and kind of attack those and being able to see that. And then if you, you look online, you see those lists of things that she did where women can, you know, get a credit card in their own name or own land or have some freedoms to just be involved in the full life of the world. And when right. I started at Liberty, I was kind of the kid who had grown up in the church and thought a woman's role is to get married and have kids. And over the course of that time, realized how important it was for us to not only have, you know, show value and dignity to women, but also to acknowledge that for us to fulfill the commission God gave in the beginning of Genesis requires that both men and women 
are not necessarily in the workforce or raising children, but that they are accepted and involved in what it means to have the whole life of the world, whether that's working or kids. And so if there were barriers to women's flourishing, then that was, then that right, was something right. that she got rid of. Then even if you disagree with her, that's something that's in line with what Christians want the world to look like. We should celebrate that. Yeah, when, when I, I was reading one of those lists of things she fought for in her lifetime, and my first thought was, wait a minute, was that like 100 years ago? I mean, it was really in her lifetime yeah. that women got the right to sign a mortgage without a man co-signing? What? How did I miss that, that we've come <laughs> that far? You know, because her, her professional lifetime is my lifetime. You know, her professional lifetime in, in, in the law, you know, is roughly the amount of time I've been alive. And to think that, you know, when I was, wow, that just freaks me out that, you know, to say, well, we didn't need a, a women's rights movement. We didn't need any of that. It's like, oh, oh, maybe we did. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, just maybe yeah. uh, we did. And I, I um, it's interesting, the friendship between uh, Ginsburg and Scalia that a lot of people have mentioned now on how they, you know, went to parties uh, dressed as, as complimentary figures from history. Um, but I, I read a story of, of someone, I think one of his clerks or friends who walked into Scalia's office one day and he had uh, two dozen roses on his desk. And he said, and the, the guy asked, what are those for? And, and he said, oh, they're, uh, they're for Ginsburg. It's her birthday. And the guy, you know, very conservative, kind of skeptic said, okay, have, has your friendship with her won you any of her votes? And he just looked, Scalia looked at him and said, some things are more important than votes. <laughs> Does that still exist? And, 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 you know, and can it exist uh, that, that people can put friendship before votes anymore. Sky, you look yeah, like you well, have a thought. Two, two things. Number one, yes, it can and does still exist. And I think it even exists in Washington. And I even think it exists among elected officials because behind the scenes, many of them do have genuine friendships. The problem is it doesn't exist in the media. It doesn't exist in front of the cameras. It doesn't exist where the public can see it because they're afraid that they will be punished by their own voters for being friendly with the other side that they've casted as evil. How can you be friendly if the other person is evil? Yeah. And I think part of the reason that Scalia and Ginsburg were able to do that is obviously they were in non-elected positions. They didn't have to worry about what people thought about them in order to maintain their, their seat. And that's part of what is plaguing our politics today. And, and we've talked about this online a little bit, but I, I think a pretty good case could be made and Ben Sass made it recently that we need to actually make some of our democratic systems a little less democratic. If we're going to protect, protect ourselves from this very toxic populist and would sentiment. You, would you like to now Ben Sass is a conservative. So what does it mean when a conservative says we need less democracy? What exactly does that mean? I know it like? sounds terrible. I don't agree necessarily with everything he put forth in his proposal, but he basically argued that we need to go back to the original constitutional way of selecting senators, which is not by popular vote, but by state legislature. Because that would insulate senators from the extreme polarizations of the political parties a little bit and return more authority to local politicians rather than making all politics national. I think there's a case to be made for that. I would like to also see changes in, in the gerrymandering fiasco that's going on right now and other things that would diminish some of the politicization yeah. of the system. But the Supreme Court's a perfect example of what can happen when people in power aren't subject to the whims of cable news and social media. They can actually build bridges. And I think that's what people find so stunning about John Roberts. He's sort of the swing vote now on the Supreme Court. He was appointed by George W. Bush. And he's not down the line conservative in his rulings because these justices, I think most of them, put their, the, their interpretation of the Constitution ahead of their political ideas identification and, and tribe. Right. And th that's why people don't understand or why somebody could say to Scalia, how can you give roses to Ginsburg or be friends with her when it's not getting you anything? Because he wasn't putting his political tribal identity ahead of all else. Right. Right. Okay. Caitlin, what was your first thought when you heard that she had passed on Friday? I mean, like a lot of people, I was worried about 
what this means for for the election season. Um, but also, it just it was striking to watch online as really conservative people who in 2016 had supported the idea that in an election year we shouldn't confirm a new justice now turn around and and some of them even quite explicitly say this isn't you know this might be hypocritical but it's because I know who I want to win. And it was such a good example to me of how when we make the stakes existential every single time, yeah. there's no principle that can stand up against that. And so if if it's the fate of the country, then yeah, you'll take whatever political power you have. There's no kind of desire to be consistent in your principles. And it's heartbreaking to watch Christians especially do that because Christians are the ones that are supposed to to have no fear of death. We believe in the resurrection. And so we can work for faithful causes on earth and not be constrained by just our own survival or the survival of our party or our people. And whether or not being consistent with that one particular precedent of not uh, you know, confirming a Supreme Court justice during election year, whether that's good or bad, the justifications behind it are the part that I'm usually concerned about. And so watching Christians in particular, because they have every theological reason to not think existential threat wise, to watch them fall prey to that is really disappointing. And it's right. another example of why this is not just a political preference, it's a failure of discipleship for churches to say, remember, you believe in the resurrection, there are no threats like this that should cause you to act any differently than you would otherwise act to be faithful citizens. Okay, but, but, Caitlin, Sky, Christian, can I play devil's advocate? <clears throat> Please. Okay. okay. Abortion is genocide. If you were in the middle of a genocide, wouldn't you need to do whatever it took to stop it? Okay. And, and you know, someone would bring up the Holocaust. Uh, you know, if you're trying to save Jewish lives, you'll lie to the Gestapo at your door. If you're trying to stop Hitler, you would consider committing murder to stop Hitler. So many of us on the right, and I count myself generally on the right, although I try to kind of hang towards the center, um, believe abortion is, you know, the Holocaust of our day. So wouldn't that, if you have that belief, wouldn't it justify bending the rules to stop a genocide. Sky, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, there's a lot to say about that, but let's, let's just, I think your premise is, is wrong, but let's just pretend. I think pretend. it's a man that you've set up. Right, but let's, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's say he's right. Let's say that that framing of, of abortion is correct. Uh -huh. Then I would assume someone who felt that strongly about it would want to pursue the tactic that is most likely to reduce or end abortion. And the evidence is overwhelming that putting a conservative in the White House to nominate a conservative to the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade, that will do virtually nothing to reduce the number of abortions in America. And that's the great lie, frankly, that both political parties have told their supporters in order to mobilize them into the voting booth. And it's not just the Republicans. The Democrats are doing it right now, too, by terrifying their voters that if Trump appoints somebody to fill Ginsburg's seat, it's going to be the end of Roe, and therefore women aren't going to have access to reproductive freedoms and on and on. Both are lying. It's not the case. It's simply not true. And that's the part that upsets me. I care about abortion, and I do believe that we should pursue just and and good means of helping women and protecting children, but all this time and energy to focus on the Supreme Court and what lever you pull once every four years is is a red herring, it's, a, it's false. And anybody who thinks I'm truly pro-life because I vote a certain way every four years is lying to themselves. Well, that's I'm just, with him. That's, <laughs> Caitlin, yeah. Caitlin, tell Skye that I'm right. Uh, no. <laughs> Okay, well, what's, what's your take on it, Caitlin? <laughs> well, I, similarly, it's that same logic of, I know so far in the future, and if I do this, then this will be the result, and this will be the next result. And there's so many steps along the way that if you're going to have that kind of thinking to justify this you know, giant end, you'll yeah. justify any means in the beginning. So maybe this time it's, 
yes, let's push for a confirmation of a Supreme Court justice. But if you're accepting your framing, then maybe it's next time I kill an abortion doctor. Maybe it's I, you know, burn up a building. And if, if, you, if that's the logic that you have, if that will lead you and sometimes to do maybe things in a gray area, but other times to do explicitly immoral things, then it seems like mm-hmm. the framing must just be wrong. Do you, do you think the Nazis have become too useful a device to justify things that we know we really shouldn't ought to be in favor of? <laughs> it's not helpful. It certainly comes up a lot. I would like to just swap out Nazis and Hitler in any conversation for the Galactic Empire and for Emperor <laughs> Palpatine. Okay. Because okay. I think there's more people who have a direct experience with Star Wars than with World War II. And at least with my kids' generation, I think they're fairly ignorant about history. But they've watched Saving Private Ryan. No, they haven't. Oh, really? Okay. No. That was like, what, 1997 or something? Yeah, but it's in reruns. It's no, 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 no. You can find they it. They haven't seen it. Uh, okay. Oh, there's I'm Elfie. working with college kids on and and above on my staff that have not watched Band of Brothers. So, yeah. and we're working on a World War II movie. So, yeah. yeah. Well, Band of Brothers is like 12 hours long. It's too long. I'm sorry. Or I, Saving I Private Ryan. If I'll learn about World War II, but I'll give you 90 minutes tops. That's that's <laughs> that's what I've got. Okay. So, how long do- to compare, <clears throat> you know, Hitler and the Nazis and the Jews with abortion. They are apples and oranges. They are not apples and apples. Oh, that's controversial. That's a little bit controversial because, you know, people are dying both ways. But to Christian's point, like the Nazis in World War II, there was a clear goal in defeating them, right? You, you send, you invade Normandy, you push back the Nazis, you kill Hitler, you win the war. If you, changed every law in the United States about abortion. If you got rid of Roe v. Wade, if you expelled every abortion doctor from uh, the medical licensing board, whatever, there would still be abortion. Yeah, there was abortion before, there will be abortion after. And I'm not saying that that means we shouldn't do anything, yeah. but it means that we need to have a bigger vision of what does it mean to be pro-life than simply how you vote every four years and getting justices on a Supreme Court. It's that is not what I'm that saying simple. you can't compare those two exactly, Scott. Right. You just, you, the analogy completely breaks down. So. Okay. Okay. So, so if we now have a more conservative Supreme Court, you know, for a generation or, or more because of this, and you're a conservative Christian who's thinking about, you know, religious freedom, thinking about gender issues, thinking about your private school and what, you know, they have to do with transgender sports. Don't you, or you, you know, your local cake baker who may be breathing a, you know, a little more freely. Isn't there a point where you say, well, okay, the outcome is, is good. So, Mape Sky, you're shaking your head at me. Yeah, I, I, I think... I think the Republicans are overplaying their hand and there's nothing in the constitution that says you have to have nine justices on the Supreme court, mm-hmm. right? They, the Democrats have said, if the Republicans do this, they are ready to, to stack the court, to expand the number of seats and fill them with liberals. Yeah. So I, I, you know, there's always been, there's a lot that's not in the constitution that has simply been norms ways of operating in a government, understandings between the parties, between the branches of government that isn't necessarily codified anywhere, but has just been, a, you know, sort of a gentleman and ladies understanding of how we are going to operate. And, and the Republicans in this case are so flagrantly violating that, that it's going to bring an equal and opposite reaction from the Democrats. And this idea that we're going to get this conservative utopia because of this appointee is, is very short-sighted. You're blowing up the whole system and may well get the reign of liberal courts and justices for the next 50 years because you've overplayed your hand. All right, Caitlin, agree, disagree? Yeah, and I think there's also this weird simplification that happens with a lot of particularly Christians, at least those are the ones I'm talking to, where they assume conservative justice equals conservative politician as if a conservative 
theory, uh, a conservative legal theory is the same as having kind of like a conservative position on XYZ social issue. And so it's that same problem of thinking, I plug in all the right things and I'll get the right results, which we've seen with the most recent abortion rulings, where there was actually some consistency in terms of, you know, going to a previous legal precedent, but it wasn't, you know, a conservative social policy or a conservative position on abortion. So you're not necessarily getting everything that you think that you're getting, and you're probably losing things, like Sky said, more, you know, in the future, not only this potential scenario, but also the more credibility that you lose when it's already so bad, especially with Christians who are overwhelmingly supportive of these kinds of policies and politicians. If you continue to show that you are this pragmatic for goals that you may or may not actually achieve, you're going to lose a lot of credibility, not only politically, but then also when people come to you and you, they say, none of these things match your theological beliefs, you're hypocrites, I don't trust you. And that's, that's an even worse outcome for Christians than it even is for the continuation of this nation that won't last forever. Okay, uh, one last possibility. People say, okay, well, if we get that one last conservative justice and now we have a, you know, a stacked conservative court for, you know, the foreseeable future, I guess I don't need to vote for Trump this year after all. So maybe then Christians can vote on more than one issue. Go, yeah. So maybe, hmm. I seriously... I seriously doubt that anyone who says that is actually not going to vote for Trump. When you have the yeah. level of cult of personality, the kind of, you know, other issues that they say are secondary, but then actually become quite primary when it comes to like immigration or economics, those kinds of things, like that seems pretty disingenuous for anyone to say. Oh, you, 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 are you with her, Sky? Are you with her on yeah. that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay. Uh, any fi- any final thoughts? Because we need to wrap this up because we got a, a big fat David French interview coming up now. Uh, any final thoughts on what you would love to see happen? What you would love to see conservative Christians doing right now, particularly, you know, publicly online, on Twitter, on Facebook right now? Christian, go. <laughs> You're not going to like my answer. Okay. I really honestly think we should be praying a lot and often, um, you know, lamenting sort of the state of the way that we approach politics and then approach and talk to one another and really seeking the Lord for, a, you know, a biblical way to think about and to talk about all of these issues, be they abortion or politics or whatever, and particularly praying for wisdom for those people that are in you know, positions of power yeah. to make decisions. I do like your answer, Christian. I do like your answer. It's uh, sort of like the one that kids give, you know, Jesus is the answer. God. He is. He is. There you go. Uh, Sky, Sky, what would, you, what would you like to see conservative Christians doing at this point? I mean, yes, Christian's answer is absolutely appropriate. I would like to see conservative Christians voicing their commitment and loyalty to Christ rather than to a political party or leader. And to say, regardless of who wins the election, regardless of who gets the Supreme Court nomination, regardless of what the court decides, we are interested in pursuing what is good for our neighbors, for the flourishing of the world, and for the glory of God, and we will not be beholden to any party or leader. If, if Christians said that vocally and loudly and consistently, I think it would go a long way to breaking the stranglehold that the Republican Party has on white Christians and that the conservative movement has on, on Christians in general. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Caitlin? I really wish this was an opportunity for us to celebrate the achievements of someone that we disagree with in other areas, especially just for me, having seen uh, On the Basis of Sex, the movie about her, or just knowing some more about her life, it's really kind of heartbreaking to realize that her experience, being one of the few women at Harvard, so closely mirrored a lot of me and my friends' experiences in seminary or in churches, where not only we were one of a few women, but also were treated with suspicion or assumed that we were less intelligent. 
And this could be an opportunity for us to go, we have failed at valuing women and including them in the full life of the world the way that unfortunately non-believers already did. And so we can celebrate that freely because of common grace and the fact that that looks a little bit more like the world that God created and intends for it to be. And then mourn our own lack of fulfilling that ourselves and seek to do better and acknowledge that we can learn from someone who is quite different from us when it comes to this specific issue. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you. And I will wrap it up unless Jason, do you have, do you have a, a, a something profound on if, if he has a Ruth Gator Ginsburg, Ginsburg tattoo, I will fall off my chair. I'm waiting for a him Ruth to like Gator Ginsburg. Is that what he said? I mean, Gator Ginsburg. I'm, That's you know the mascot. I mean. RBG. That's the mascot. I actually, team. I had something really profound and that just, it's gone now. I just, Oh, I'm sorry. I should have asked you sooner. Just, I'm yeah. so, yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I will add is that once again, we're completely forgetting that non-white evangelical Christians see the judiciary very differently than white evangelical Christians because their life experience has been so different. So if we could just stop and pause and say, what is the, what is the difference in experience that makes my you know, non-white evangelical, same belief, conservative theology, but that makes their view of a Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I almost said Gator Ginsburg, Gator Bader Ginsburg makes their view of a progressive justice so much different than the one that I grew up with. Uh, because when we, just, when we just decide that the Bible says you have to be in this party or on this side of this aisle, and we completely forget all of the people that are reading the same Bible and are in a completely different position than us, we're, I think we're just really truncating the gospel and, and uh, uh, minimizing what God, what actually breaks God's heart, which includes, but is not limited to the things that white Christians are upset about. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Caitlin. Glad you could <laughs> jump in and live, live through Sky's technical difficulties. And, uh, and we will see you guys next week. And I'm sure there'll be even more fun stuff to talk about. <laughs> see you later, y'all. Bye, everybody. Although the church has existed for 2,000 years and Christians have gathered on Sundays to worship from the very beginning, a lot has changed. In fact, the only aspect of Christian worship that has endured across every generation, every ethnicity, every economic and denominational barrier has been the simple elements of the bread and the cup. This fall, we've launched a new series in With God Daily looking at the church. And to begin, we're starting by looking at the table. Some traditions call it communion, others the Lord's Supper, and some call it the Eucharist. We're exploring how the table unites and divides us, how Jesus used his table to welcome sinners and bring healing and how the church can do that as well. And we're exploring why so many contemporary churches have marginalized or abandoned the table altogether. It's really an intriguing series and just the beginning of many more weeks of looking at the church in these times of upheaval and change. If you haven't already, now is a great time to sign up for With God Daily. It's available in both written and audio formats and via email or mobile app. Not only will you learn a lot, but you'll be drawn into deeper communion with God through scripture and prayers that engage your intellect and don't just tug on your emotions. To sign up, go to withgoddaily.com and discover what thousands already know, that With God Daily is the daily devotional for people who hate daily devotionals. As you've already heard, David French is back this week to talk about guns, specifically America's gun culture. As you're about to hear, we talk about the overall decline in gun crime in America, but the startling rise in mass shootings and suicides. I'm still trying to reconcile America's gun culture with Christianity, and David and I don't always agree on how things fit together. And as I said earlier, after re-listening to the interview, there's a few areas where I wish I would followed up with a different question or a different idea but there's always 2020 hindsight. Still, I think you're gonna find this interview really interesting and helpful. David French is a brilliant writer and thinker, a founder of The Dispatch and a civil rights attorney. He's also a veteran and a strong supporter of gun rights and the Second Amendment. When we sat down for this conversation, I expected it to go 30 or 40 minutes like most Holy Post interviews, while it turned out to be about 90 minutes. David was incredibly generous with his time, but what you're about to hear is an edited version of the conversation that's a little bit under 60 minutes. 
However, for our Patreon supporters, we've decided to post the full unedited 90 minute version. And that includes a lot of stuff that we didn't have time to even touch on in this edited shorter version, including a discussion of guns and slavery and civil rights, which was just amazing. So if you've been wavering on whether or not to become a Patreon supporter of The Holy Post, this is definitely the week to do it. All right, here is my conversation with David French. David French, welcome back to The Holy Post. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, you were very kind to come on last time. And then, uh, as I just said to you earlier, somebody on Twitter wanted to understand your views of guns and the Second Amendment. And I replied back to this listener saying, oh, it'd be great to have him back. And before we could even formally ask you, you jumped on Twitter and said, I'd love to come back. So like, great, let's, <laughs> let's do it. Let's book him, um, which was wonderful. So you're being very generous with your time and appreciate it. Before we get into this conversation, though, I just want everybody out there to know up front, you are a very accomplished attorney. You have argued at all levels of government, I'm assuming, in different courts for different cases. Mm -hmm. You've done a lot on uh, constitutional rights, mostly freedom of speech. Is that right? Free speech, free exercise, religion, due process. Basically, I would call myself a civil liberties lawyer. Okay. And you attended Harvard Law School. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. I'm a pastor, basically. That's my, that's my <laughs> training. I am not an attorney. Uh, and I don't have the legal knowledge, obviously, that you have. So I am totally over my head in this conversation. So give me no. a little grace in that. Well, you're going to be over my head on the theological aspects of this. So, because, you know, there's, well, there's I don't know how legal... Much- there's, right. there's legal, enough. you know, and there's practical. I mean, I might, I, I own a number of guns. I'm a veteran of uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. So I have a lot of experience with firearms, um, which is different from a lot of people who argue about firearms online. <laughs> exactly. My, um, my experience with firearms is mostly duck hunt on Nintendo. So, um, <laughs> I mean, I have fired some actual firearms at times, but I'm, I'm not a veteran. I don't have that kind of training or experience. That's for sure. Um, so just so everyone run, understands who is coming from what point of view and from <laughs> what level of training, this is not a fair fight. Um, not that it's a fight at all. But let's begin where the question on Twitter arose, which some, somebody was asking, because you uh, spoke very eloquently and, and informatively about your pro-life positions, and you've written a lot mm-hmm. about that recently. And mm-hmm. somebody on Twitter was asking, how does your pro-life views fit with your advocacy for the Second Amendment and gun ownership? I don't yeah. think those two things have to be contrary, but some people think they are. So when you get that question, how do you reconcile those two pieces? Yeah, so I, I think I, I sort of go back to first principles and let's just progress from there. So, um, and this is where, you know, we're going to be intruding onto to your territory. Um, so I, I think there's a biblical and natural law right of self-defense that human beings have, that a human being has a right to defend himself and a right to defend others. Um, you know, there's, there's, some biblical, there's some biblical basis for this. I mean, you know, if you go back to... Um, you know, if you go back to uh, um, Exodus, you know, there's the Exodus 22 two. if there's a thief found breaking in his truck so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him. Uh, there was blood guilt during the day, but, you know, not at night. I mean, you have the situation where Nehemiah is rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and, and you know, Nehemiah 414. I don't have these memorized, uh, y'all, that, that would be... <laughs> But I'm, I'm, I'm reading them right now. Nehemiah 4.14, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. You know, uh, the climax of the book of Esther is, um, you know, the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend their lives, to destroy and to kill and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods, Esther 8.11. Uh, and then, Esther, Esther 9.5 indicates that Jews did just that. They, they struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them. Um, and so there is this sort of, there's this very long um, biblical history of a basic right of self-defense, that if someone is attacking my family, if someone is attacking me, you have the ability to defend yourself. Now, I know also there's martyrdom, right? You know, Stephen didn't, attack anyone. Jesus didn't <laughs> attack anyone. There's, uh, you know, 
a, a long history of Christian martyrs who did not fight back and, and were martyred for their faith. Um, I think also, however, there might be a, there's a difference between an operation of the state uh, designed to persecute somebody um, versus a defense of yourself from, you know, an immediate armed attack. I put it this way, if Sir Thomas More, you know, to Catholic St. Thomas More was on his way to confront the ruling authorities and a thief way laid him and attacked him, I feel like he'd still be St. Thomas More <laughs> if he defended himself from the thief before he confronted the king's court, if, if, that, yeah. makes, if that makes sense. So I, that's where I begin is there is, a, and, and that's sort of the foundation of the, actually the American Second Amendment as the Supreme Court laid out in the Heller decision, not those biblical verses that I laid out, but this idea of there does exist kind of an inalienable right of self-defense and defense of your family. That is, is something that, uh, we all enjoy that we all have. And so that's the fundamental basis of what the sort of the second amendment is, or the right of gun ownership is based upon. Uh, and I know you're well aware there is a, a long tradition in the, in Christianity of pacifism. Right. And there are some who still make those, those arguments. I've never been entirely persuaded by the pacifist argument. I respect right. it. I've, re I've always respected it. I, I just don't quite see. Um, well, frankly, I, I have veterans in my family. I have counseled veterans as a pastor. And I don't see anywhere, especially in the New Testament, of Jesus turning away or calling somebody away from a military vocation as a prerequisite to being a Christian or being a disciple. So I, I don't quite see that. Now, there may be a difference between resistance or armed resistance on behalf of the state Romans 13 versus mm -hmm. individual. And we get in all that, but I'm not as concerned about I, all that to say, I don't want to argue about pacifism. That's not right, right. My, my interest here, but um, I've read some of what you've written on this issue and you've brought up the right of personal defense as, as foundational to the second amendment, although it's not articulated explicitly in the second amendment. And you're rooting that in prior legal history, English common yeah. law. So explain right. some of that, because when I just read the single sentence of the Second Amendment, I don't get from that personal self-defense, mm -hmm. wh whereas it does talk about an armed and well-regulated militia. Yeah, so you have the pre uh, precatory clause and the operational clause of the Second Amendment. It's very short. You know, you have the, the first, the, the well-regulated militia is not the operative clause. The right of the people to keep and bear arms is the operative clause. But if you look at the history of gun ownership, and, and the right of gun ownership, not just the fact of gun ownership, but the right of gun ownership. It's very much grounded in um, English law, which provided Protestant citizens with a right of armed self-defense. Um, there was- a But not the Catholics. A real little bit of religious <laughs> discrimination. Uh, yeah. So, um, and you also look at state constitutions and there are state constitutions that made this more explicit that they weren't, they weren't, um, grounding uh, the, 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 pref the preface of the right in the, in the militia. So there's a, a lot of state constitutional law. There is the English common law that preceded this. There is the uh, operative clause of the Second Amendment, which is the right of the people to keep and bear arms, not the right of the militia, um, which given that a militia is ultimately controlled by the state, it is a, a militia is a state entity, it would be odd for the Bill of Rights con to contain a state right in the enumeration of individual rights and the right of the people to keep and bear arms is really a, a key, that's the key phrase. And it's grounded in all of that history. And that, that history is not just individual self-defense and not just defense of family. Um, you know, it's also the reason why there's a militia uh, statement is uh, quite frankly, one of the reasons why you kept a weapon um, in colonial times prior to the ratification of the Second Amendment was uh, there were citizen militias that engaged in collective self-defense against the crown. I mean, that's in fact how we got to Lexington and Concord, and that's how, you know, the, the, initial, col uh, uh, the, the initial colonial army was comprised of a whole pile of people who took their personal musket off from above the fireplace. Uh, so there was an immediate, very recent history in that, you know, in militia action as a use of a personal weapon. Um, 
uh, not just as individual self-defense or defense of family, but collective self-defense. Um, okay, let's turn toward contemporary issues. So my, I, I live in the same community where I grew up, which I never expected uh-huh. to, but here, here I am. <laughs> I am a product of public schools my whole life, including uh, college, everything up until seminary. My kids are now a part of the same school district that I more or less went to and my wife. And they go to public schools every day. And from the time my kids were young, I, they've had to worry about school shootings. And that was something, you know, 30 years ago, I never had to think about. It never occurred to me to worry about a shooter entering my school. But now we have these active shooter drills and all that stuff going on. And not only does it grieve me, but it kind of makes me angry that right. that's the reality that my children are growing up in. And I know in some places it's far worse. There's a lot of other dangers that they face. So when the pandemic hit and school shut down, as, as traumatic as that has been for many families and many communities, uh, my silver lining in it was when I dropped my kids off at school, I, I'm not dropping them off at school. I don't have to worry about a school shooting for the next couple months, which mm-hmm. is kind of sick to think about. But before sitting down and talking to you, I looked up the statistics on mass shootings in the United States this mm-hmm. year, assuming right. that they would have been down because we're not congregating in large places. We're not in movie right. theaters. We're not in schools, things like that. And this is defined as four victims or more mass mm-hmm. shootings in 2020. In May of 2020, there were 60 mass shootings in the United States, which broke a record. Mm-hmm. And in June, it was 95 and in July, it was 87. And we're on track for more than well, close to 600 mass shootings in the United States this year, which would be more than double the total in 2014. So mm-hmm. here's the question, like, what do we do about this? Short of a constitutional amendment to remove the Second Amendment, as somebody who's a strong gun advocate, what do you believe is the right way to address this? And I'm convinced that a a ban of assault rifles is not going to do anything. So I know the Democrats and other progressives are putting forward those kinds of answers. And they think, I think it's more symbolic than, than anything meaningful. But what do you say to people when you're addressing those kinds of concerns? So I, you know, if you look at gun violence more broadly, um, let's, I, I say when I'm, when I'm thinking about the problems that we have in the United States of unlawful uses of guns, dead uses of guns, unjustified uses of guns, we have, sort of three big buckets. Uh, one is suicide. Uh, yes. Suicide is uh, the most common way in which a person dies by a firearm in the United States. The, the other one is what I would call uh, no, no shooting is uh, garden variety, but what you would say sort of like the normal n- n- non-mass shooting gun violence. Right, so, right. You know, like Street robbery, violence, gang violence. Uh, exactly. Right, muggings, then you have like that. the mass shooting. Now, the definition of a mass shooting is a little bit up for debate. So, you know, the one that you used one um, definition, which was what that there's four four victims um, or more, right? Which could be four people who die, or one who dies and three are injured. Right. Others are, you know, uh, three at least three who die, or you know. So, it, depending on how you define it, there's more or less. But the bottom line is, we have way too many. Um, if either, in either case. So what right. do we do? Um, well, let's, let's look at what, who is doing this and how do we, uh, what do we know about them? Um, now, when it comes to suicides, uh, that is a vexing problem that has hit um, many societies, regardless of the level of gun ownership. So there are other societies who have higher suicide rates like say Japan or South Korea, with very low uh, levels of gun ownership. Sure. Um, so it's harder to tie suicide to specifically to, to suicide rates to gun ownership. Well, uh, um, let me p- pause you there for a second though. And I, admittedly, this is anecdotal, mm-hmm. but a couple of years ago I was speaking in a rural part of the country and I was talking to a group of pastors from that region and I was asking them, what, what are some of the challenges you're up against? Which I often ask when I'm speaking someplace. And one of these pastors who'd been in that area for decades said guns. And Mm -hmm. I had assumed guns had always been there. It's a rural part of the country. It's not unheard of. And he said, no, it's just, there's a lot more guns, a lot more handguns, a lot more people carrying things. It's not just rifles and things like that anymore. And he mentioned that this was an area of high unemployment 
and a lot of drug use, the opioid epidemic had really mm-hmm. hit hard in this part of the country. Yeah. And along with that came a lot of domestic violence, spousal abuse, mm-hmm. child abuse. And he said that they used to have a program in their community where all the church leaders and elders of these churches had some kind of a hotline that a woman yeah. could call if her husband was drunk or abusive or whatever, and they would show up at the house and either get her out or sit down with the guy and calm him down. And he said that whole program has fallen apart because nobody wants to go to a house now with a raging guy with a gun. And mm-hmm. we're not able to protect these women and children the way we used to. In some cases, even the police don't want to show up because everyone is armed all the time. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, he mentioned suicide. And yes, it's, it's a tragic problem in a lot of communities, but he said in the past, uh, if somebody was going to try to take their life, more often than not, I as a pastor had a chance after they had attempted to meet with them, to see them in the hospital, to begin that process of hopefully counseling. But he said with a gun, you often don't get a second chance because right. it's so lethal. So, and that's the problem with, I mean, 60% of gun deaths in this country are suicide. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately it's growing a, a lot among young people. And, you know, gun is far more lethal than many other forms of attempted suicide. So you don't get that second chance. Yeah. Well, you know, what's far more lethal than guns are opioids <laughs> when yeah. it comes to the raw numbers, you know, sure. so the raw, it's um, that this, what I'm saying is suicide is a very complicated issue for which there's a lot of evidence that fatal self-harm, um, the, either the intention of fatal self-harm it, that, or the intention of fatal self-harm is not necessarily easily tied to the prevalence of guns or the, the ability to fatally self-harm is not necessarily easily tied to the presence of guns. Other societies that have fewer guns have a lot more problems with suicide, have higher suicide rates than we do. They're ju- people are just as capable of killing themselves without a gun. And so the question you have is, again, when you're talking about do I have, because again, you're, you know, you're, you're against the background of I have a right of self-defense, okay? So I have a right of self-defense. If uh, somebody else is uh, at risk of suicide, the question is, what is the intervention that you do uh, to try to deal with that suicide without impairing the right of self-defense that I as a law-abiding citizen possess? Um, and that, you know, so that's, that's the big public policy question uh, because that right, of, that right that I have of self-defense persists and exists. Now, so, the thing about it- I'm assuming not just Americans have a right of self-defense, right? You would right. argue that this is, a, as you've said earlier, a biblical idea. So mm-hmm. people in, in all other countries have a right of self-defense, but they don't have the same rate of gun violence as the United States because they don't need as many guns to defend themselves because there's probably not 400 million guns floating around their societies. Yeah, well, that's the, you hit the key thing. So if I go to, if I have a right of self-defense, it is a right of self-defense against reasonably foreseeable threats. Okay, so if let's say I'm, let's say what, you know, what's a society that has very few guns? Um, we'll just call this utopia. <laughs> You know, let's okay. say I, I fly away from the United States of America and I land in Utopia. And in Utopia, they don't have guns. There was never a gun culture. Mm-hmm. Um, there was never widespread ownership of firearms. It never existed. Uh, the state has an absolute monopoly over the use of force. There's no private ownership of weapons. If I'm in Utopia um, and, I, and I have that right of self-defense, it's a right of self-defense against reasonably foreseeable threats. And what is the reasonably foreseeable threat? It might be a guy with fists or it might be a guy with a baseball bat. It might be, um, you know, a person with some, a knife, you know, for a kitchen knife or whatever. Um, and to say that I have a right of self-defense is not to say I have a right to f- obtain any conceivable weapon that I can think of that I could use in self-defense. So, for example, in the United States, I oppose... I have no problem with existing laws that dramatically restrict your ability to own a uh, fully automatic firearm Uh, because the criminal threat in the United States of America is not coming from a fully automatic firearm. For almost 100 years, we have restricted ownership of these things. The criminal threat in the United States predominantly comes from a semi-automatic handgun. So so, this relates to the Supreme Court. Is it was this Keller who, in that case, argued that the amendment protects weapons in common use? 
common use for lawful purposes. Okay, common use. But, but I mean, your example is a really good one. We don't have auto, automatic weapons have been severely limited mm -hmm. and not circulated in the population. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's unlikely a criminal will have one. Therefore, it's unnecessary for a law abiding citizen to have access to one. Mm -hmm. But couldn't you just move that? slide that down a little bit and argue that, well, the only reason why certain weapons are in common use is because we as a society have allowed them to be, and the government has allowed them to be. Well, but again, you're, begin you're, you're sort of beginning with the, the, the wrong premise, which is we have the, the underlying basic realities you begin with a right of self-defense from reasonable foreseeable threats. So, Colonists uh, also, you know, although the Second Amendment is not directly related to hunting, <laughs> which, you know, uh, was uh, a lot of people talk about, well, you know, look, I have no objection to owning a firearm for hunting. Well, hunting isn't really the purpose of the Second Amendment. Right. But Fair as enough. a matter of fact, you know, uh, we have a very long history of the U.S. Um, of the use of firearms for Defense of families, defense of communities, especially during um, westward expansion, which there's a lot of a lot of bad there also, of course, because you know you're talking about um, the centuries of conflicts with Native Americans, et cetera, et cetera. You have a, a long history of the use of the firearm for hunting as the frontier moved continually west. Sure. So from the beginning of this country, firearm ownership has been in the DNA of it, in a way it wasn't, say, um, you know, in Belgium or, you know, in countries with different histories. So, sure. you know, one of the things that you would say about another country that has a, a different culture of ownership of firearms, et cetera, is that's a different country with a very different history. And we are this country with this history. And in this country with this history, the firearm has been part of our culture since before the founding of our constitutional republic, uh, and has been deemed, has been considered a necessary that that uh, it considered by countless families a necessary part of the home uh, since before the founding of the republic. And so this is something where you kind of look at it now and you go, if America was a different country and with a different history, yeah, our our concept of self defense and what's necessary for self defense would be different. Uh, it, it just would be, but it, we're not yeah. that other different country. Well, let's talk then, uh, going back to the history issue, which I think is a huge factor that we don't talk enough about, the unique cultural development of the United States and its frontier right. mindset and, and the role the guns have played in that. It is, uh, it's not entirely unique to the United States, but it is uncommon in other countries. And we do have 400 million guns circulating in this mm -hmm. country, which are not going to just suddenly disappear. Are we destined to a society in which the only option is everyone is trained and armed all the time. And is that kind of a society really more free? Well, I don't think so. So here's one thing to, to, to keep in mind as we talk about this. Um, America has more guns than it ever has had. Uh, 400 million uh, is a good estimate. I mean, nobody knows for sure the number, but it's more than one gun a person. Right. Um, and we also have a lot less gun crime than we used to have, which a lot of people don't realize that. We have a lot less gun crime than we used to have. Now, correlation does not equal causation. Right. Because if you look at what other advanced Western societies, there was a remarkably similar curve on the crime rates um, that occurred around the same time in history. Western society just got less, it got more criminal and violent, and then it got less violent for a million complicated reasons, for a lot of reasons. But we have, one thing is we have is we have more guns. We also have less crime. So, and crime dropped pretty dramatically. Now we've had some upticks here recently. And I would say, argue that the recent upticks that we've had, you wouldn't tie necessarily to having more guns around. You would tie to some cultural, some uh, political and, and so uh, cultural factors that are flaring at the moment. But so there is not necessarily a correlation or a causation that for every new gun or every new set of guns that are introduced into a society that that society becomes more violent. Right. That's just not the way it works. Although I will say that there is a sort of a level of gun ownership that will lead certain kinds of societies to have more gun violence. I mean, 
um, you know, you look at other societies that have high levels of gun ownership and they don't have the same kind of gun violence rates like a Switzerland or an Israel. But again, these country to country comparisons are, are hard, are hard to make. So, uh, you know, yeah, I, I think that, um, when you look at the number of guns that we have, that's not to say that all of a sudden that means that you got to have a gun to feel safe in the society. And it's kind of in an empirical way, you should feel more safe in the society right now, whether or not you have a gun. Because but you it are seems like right a lot of the rhetoric you bump into, though, and maybe this is being pushed by the NRA, if you recall, after the, the horrible shooting at Sandy Hook, Wayne LaPierre said the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And there was this call for arming of teachers and things like that. And I mean, the thought as a, and my kids were young at the time, the thought of sending my kids to a school with a teacher in their classroom who's armed terrified me. Why? Well, partly because I'm a pastor and I've been called into situations, including domestic situations where people, you know, a lot of folks say, well, you don't want bad guys getting guns. You don't want people with mental illness getting guns. You don't want criminals getting guns. No one's a criminal until they commit a criminal act. I'm not a criminal until I commit a criminal act. And I know, and I've been in situations where Christian people, godly people are, are spun out into a rage of domestic anger. And I'm thinking, what would have happened in this household had there been a gun readily handy? So I, you know, would we do all kinds have... of stupid things just because there's 24 hour access to tattoos. What happens when there's 24 constant access to firearms everywhere we go? So I would rather have an armed teacher than a police officer in school. And, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Number one, a police officer has a higher crime rate than an armed, uh, a, a, the, all the best available data says that the crime rate amongst police officers is higher than the crime rate of people who are private citizens who own concealed, who have concealed carry permits. That doesn't really so, make me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But the other thing is what's the realistic, um, the, the realistic way in which police operate in schools. One of the realistic ways in which police officers operate in schools is the, the criminalization of school discipline. Sure. Um, so a fight isn't a fight anymore. It's an assault, right? Right. Um, Johnny is caught with some weed and rather than having a stern talking to and uh, a three day suspension and being handed over to the parents to deal with, well, then he's handed over to juvenile, <laughs> the juvenile cr detention, the juvenile criminal process, you know, that, so police officers result in criminalization of school discipline, which I think is a big problem. And I don't think cr police officers, uh, many of them are awesome and courageous and fantastic, but, um, as far as like the raw danger present of a, uh, of a private citizen who's a concealed carry permit holder, um, that's nil. Um, that's that's just nil. Uh, it's not non-existent, but it's very, 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 very small. And so, you know, when I find out that somebody is a concealed carry permit holder, I don't, I'm not alarmed at all. But, you know, in fact, one of the things that's nice about it is I just know that that's a human being, unlike anyone else around me, who's passed a background check. Um, who, you know, I, I, if I know Bob is sitting to my right and he's a concealed carry permit holder and there's Barry sitting to my left and I don't know anything about him, one thing I know about Bob is he has no criminal history. <laughs> I don't know that about Barry. And so- Fair enough, but it, I, I, I know lots of people without a criminal history who have serious anger problems. And, and my point being, Okay. Gosh, I was well, just in, on, I was just on. at my I was just at my alma mater, which is a yeah. large state university, and I was thinking back to uh, different bars I was in as a student there, different frat houses I was in, and the fights I saw. And I just you think about some of those normal, ordinary sort of road rage, domestic arguments. You go on down the list and think, how much worse could some of these situations have gotten if the people involved were armed? But you know that I understand again. That's intellectually that is an argument that makes sense the data doesn't really indicate that there's a whole lot of people who go from no crime to murder crime um that, that there is it's uh let me use a a, a a crude analogy i remember there was recently a evangelical star who was caught with drugs and uh, a teenage guy a teenage boy and somebody said, I doubt that's the first time that sure. he crossed the line. Because people don't typically go from chaste and sober to drugs and uh, exploitation of teens. Like, that's, 
most people who commit murder, the vast, 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 vast majority of people who are, who are going to use a gun violently against another person, they're not accelerating from nothing to murder. Um, and you hear a lot about, oh, but you know, now when people have more weapons and they're gonna be road rage and there's gonna be normal arguments will accelerate into deadly violence in a way that they wouldn't. That's just not the way the numbers bear out. I mean, I, once again, as I said, that the crime rate amongst people who are lawful concealed carry permit holders is really low. And there are millions of concealed carry permit holders, millions out there. That's not the community of people if you're talking about crime, uh, gun violence as a social problem, that's not the community of people that are bringing the relevant, terrible, crushing numbers to bear in gun violence. It's criminals using guns. And then a lot of the mass shooters, the ones that are not sort of like, um, not sort of like uh, gang violence or whatever, but a lot of the mass shooters like the Sandy Hook, like Aurora, and you can go through the number, the people again and again and again, these are individuals who have um, profound problems that have radiated warning signs for which there have not there has not been the ability either the people around them did not have the legal ability or the knowledge to deal with it and that's going to get to one of my my things that i really strongly advocate to deal with mass shootings uh and that is something called the red flag law yeah and, and this red flag we need it's something that allows me because right now i can't if if I know there's a guy named Johnny and Johnny is out there radiating and broadcasting that he's unstable and intense deadly harm, you know, depending on the state, it can be hard to get an adjudication of mental unfitness. Sort of uh, violent ideation is not unlawful to the extent that it would deny them their, their right to own or possess a weapon. So the tools are limited that you have. And time and time again, and you look at these mass shootings and you say, you know, how many times we've heard, oh, there were warning signs. And people didn't have the tools to deal with the warning signs. And the thing I like about a red flag law is it represents a temporary deprivation of a First Amendment right on a showing of real evidence that a person is a problem. I mean, not First Amendment, Second Amendment, on a showing of real evidence. So again, when you're looking at why would you, on what basis do you diminish a right of self-defense? My argument is you diminish a right of self-defense on the basis of an individual showing of misconduct or unfitness. And, and that's how we should deal with it. So 30 years ago, even 20 years ago, we didn't have the number of mass shootings that we have now. Yeah. We also didn't have these red flag laws. So what do you attribute that to? Well, you know, I don't know if you read Malcolm Gladwell's uh, I article did. in the New Yorker. So yeah. I think what we have, we're in the grips of is uh, a contagion that mass shootings and the, fame, and the fame and the notoriety of one mass shooting builds upon itself and builds, and, and builds upon and motivates the um, next. And so uh, what Gladwell compared it to is almost like a, a riot, except a slow motion riot. You know, the first right. person who picks up the brick and throws it, diminish it, sort of lowers the permission structure for the second person to pick up the brick and throw it. And then once two bricks are thrown, then the third person, it's easier for the third person to pick it up and the fourth and the fifth. And what we've seen is, and especially as you, you follow the, following the Columbine shooting, is the people who commit mass shootings will often intentionally start to copy or mimic those people who came before. And it's a, so what ends up happening is you have a rolling um, copycat contagion um, that is horrific and vicious and deadly and evil and something that I think quite honestly the the gun rights community uh, presents the, the if the gun rights community wants to maintain public support for gun rights needs to get on board helping solve this because the the thing the, while mass shootings are a very small percentage of murders in the United States I mean People talk a lot about the AR-15, but more people are killed by people's fists than by AR-15s in the U.S. Um, but mass shootings are tra deeply traumatic, not just to the victims and the victims' families, but deeply traumatic to a community and right. for years, for years. And so um, that's why I'm so strongly support red flag laws is because part of the way in which the contagion works actually provides smart law enforcement and, and people around these shooters with the warnings 
that they sometimes need to have of the aberrational behavior of the fant- uh, the 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 ideation surrounding mass killings, et cetera. And so I think these red flag laws are just critical. I think they're very, very, very important. Now they have to be drafted correctly, but I think they're absolutely important. And again, they have the virtue of saying to law-abiding America uh, and those Americans who are not engaged in dangerous ideation, that you have a right, your right of self-defense is going to be protected. And for those people who have engaged in conduct, conduct, that indicates that they're a danger to others, then your right of self-defense or your right to own and possess a weapon is, is subject to lawful deprivation. I remember a couple of years ago, many years ago now, my wife and I went to see a movie and there were these really obnoxious older teenagers in, in the theater behind us who, it was a kid's movie we were watching. Mm-hmm. I don't know why they were in there, but they were being super rude and they were swearing and using all this profanity. This is probably close to 20 years ago. And I just got up out of my seat and I went and I sat down in the midst of that group of teenagers in the back of the theater. And they all thought I was crazy. And I just said, listen, guys, there's a lot of families here. We're trying to enjoy a movie. Can you please either quiet down or leave or I'm going to have to get the manager? Yeah. Eventually, I went and got the manager and I had him thrown out of there. I didn't think twice about it. It didn't. Mm-hmm. It never occurred to me that this was a, a bad idea to, to bust a bunch of teenagers and kick them out of a, a children's family movie. In a culture saturated with guns, I don't think I would do that. I'm not sure I would, I would feel comfortable. I don't know if I would confront somebody who's behaving obnoxiously or violently or uh, intoxicated in a public set. I don't know what it would do to our culture if I'm thinking everyone's got a gun. Well, now, probably under current law where you were, it would have been unlawful for them to carry a gun. And yeah, but I don't, why, I don't think that right, sticker so, on a door really prevents people who don't want to put I, a gun away I, from carrying a gun. I guess if there's already a criminal law that applies that would prevent them from doing what you fear. What is it that you're seeking? I, I'm, I'm, this isn't about law. This is oh, okay. about culture. This is about mm-hmm. culture, a culture in which a, a, a high percentage of people are armed regularly in public places, in schools, in churches, in theaters, in gatherings. It changes the, the interpersonal dynamics of a society. Hmm if all those guns are now some people would argue it changes it for the better because it's a deterrent. It prevents violent crime because why would you, this is the argument of the concealed carry folks. It, it deters crime on the flip side. It may well deter interactions that would ultimately be positive for a community because it prevents a citizen like me from getting up and intervening in a situation that normally I would intervene because I don't feel like my life is at risk. Yeah, I mean, I guess we have different perceptions of what that risk is. Um, you know, if you're talking about, and because there's been in really adults in movie theaters, sure, <laughs> you know, that I've said something to, you know, please stop. And even though I live in Tennessee, which is a very gun rights supporting state, with lots of concealed carry permit holders, I don't think Uh oh, he's going to get ticked off and shoot me. Like that would be so vanishingly rare. Like that's so vanishingly rare. And, um, but maybe that's just because I know where gun crime comes from. You know, they, where, where is it not rare or, or it's rare in most communities, but, but where is it, um, something that is significant enough to be nervous about and a random encounter in a movie theater is not that it's not it. Now, one of the things that changes our perception of risk is we now have social media in a country of 320 million people. So any incident anywhere we now learn about, whereas before, if somebody got mad in a movie theater and shot someone in Des Moines and I'm living in Franklin, Tennessee, where I live now, I would never hear about it. It wouldn't be national news. It wouldn't be all over Twitter. But now, you know, we learn about every negative thing and it's one of the things that's caught increasing national polarization. But, um, I am not, I, I think that there is no reason for a person in the U.S. to be nervous uh, about people who pass background checks possessing weapons, um, you know, the concealed carry permit holder. Now, here's what I would say, though. I think if you're an American, considering where, whether to purchase firearm or not, I would say do not do it unless you intend to become proficient in its use. 
Do not do it unless you tend to train yourself in its use. Don't just have it when you don't know how to use it and, and are, have not trained with it. Don't just have it. Um, but if you're going to be a, a, a owner of a firearm, be responsible with it. Be intentional in your um, training with it so that you're familiar with it. You know how to use it. It is not something that is scary to you. It is something that is familiar to you. Um, but yeah, I just don't, maybe we just have a different perspective of this, but I, I just don't feel like um, whether I'm, conf you know, talking to angry teens or, or adults who are acting strangely in public, unless they're acting really strangely, that somebody's just going to get ticked off and try to blow me away. Like I, that just doesn't cross my mind. Well, I, you know, I think our fundamental difference is probably not legal and it's probably not even on the nature of, of guns. I think we may just, you may have more faith in your fellow man than I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, Maybe I've been in ministry too long. I, I mean, I am a Calvinist. I mean, like tea and tulip is total depravity. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. You know, so no, I don't have faith in my fellow man. I don't have faith in government systems. Uh, I don't have faith in ability to create that nation called utopia that we talked about earlier. Right. I don't have any faith in any of that. Yeah. But I also know uh, enough about sort of the way in pe the way in which real people interact in the world typically to know what should concern me and not concern me. And, you know, one of the things that at, on a, on a public policy scale that doesn't concern me is the zero to murder escalation. Um, one thing that really does concern me is why are so many people still possessing guns who can't lawfully possess guns? So that is, and that's where I wish we could have a lot of public policy um, and a lot of cultural agreement is that, if we look at what is uh, one of our big problems with gun crime is that we've got a ton of people who cannot lawfully possess a gun, possessing a gun or obtaining more guns. There's massive cultural and social consensus that that should not happen. And then another thing that we're beginning to have more and more consensus of is why is a person who's giving off red flags that they're about to do something awful and not just mass shootings, but domestic violence. Um, why are they, and even suicide, a red flag law can deal with suicide as well. Why are we not um, targeting more specifically our state intervention with those people who have demonstrated danger? And, and that's where, you know, I think we've got a lot of uh, progress to make on the people who possess a weapon, who should not possess a weapon under the law, and the people who are demonstrating real danger. And while they're demonstrating real danger, should not possess a weapon. And I think I we've got... A lot I of could not agree more. What I do know is I, as I travel internationally, there are places where I go that don't have the guns that I don't worry about it. And people, it's a different, it creates a different environment or atmosphere. I'm not saying nobody has a gun or no criminal does, but um, I, I worry about decades from now, what kind of place, what kind of culture are we creating? And is it really the one we want? Um, well, let, let me ask you this. So do, in the place where you live, like your neighborhood and your, mm -hmm. your community, is there a culture of gun ownership there or no? Um, I would, my guess would be probably 30% of the households here probably have a gun. Okay. I would say probably about 80% of where I am <laughs> have a gun. Mm -hmm. um, but if you visited here, you would not feel the least bit. Sure. Like, you know, have you been, I, I'm sure, you know, like uh, I, I call Nashville as evangelical Jerusalem and, uh, <laughs> and Franklin is where evangelical Jerusalem lives, like in commutes to work in Nashville. <laughs> like this is like uh, uh, Franklin, Tennessee is sort of like one of your like uh, prosperous. Oh, I've been there. Family, you know, I know, I know Franklin. Yeah. Bedroom communities. And right. uh, you know, I don't know that 80% is right, but a very high percentage. Sure. Um, and so, you know, in those circumstances, the background culture matters a ton more than the, the ownership of guns for creating an atmosphere of menace or not menace right. um, well, when you're in the community. I, the difference is in, in my community, I live in Wheaton, if you're familiar with Wheaton College. Right, it, yeah. It's probably not that different from Franklin. Yeah. And I've been a pastor of a church here, not on staff anymore, but, you know, it's, it's a fairly affluent suburban evangelical church. 
And yet over the years I was there, I was, and we, oh gosh, on a Sunday, two services, we probably had eight, 900 people. Yeah. And on a number of occasions, there were public disturbances in the sanctuary because of somebody with mental illness or somebody mm-hmm. who's having a domestic dispute, you know, just various things that pop up even yeah. in affluent, educated, stable communities. And the thought of 20 years from now, if half the people in that room are armed, I don't know who's going to have a mental breakdown. I don't know who's going to have a psychotic episode, even though they have no history of it. I don't know who's having a domestic problem that might bring that to the church like happened in Texas, tragically, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. But back when I was pastoring in that church in the early 2000s, it never crossed my mind that we would have a gun problem in this community or in this church because nobody carried a gun. Mm-hmm. And now increasingly, as I'm there, I'm finding out there are more and more people who are getting armed. And most of them are like you, are thoughtful, uh, stable, trained in how to use a firearm. I'm not worried about it, but I'd been there long enough to know, hey, in a community of a thousand people, there's a certain percentage that are, are just not stable, yeah. either mentally or relationally. And do we want to throw a bunch of guns into that? And so I'm painting worst case scenario. I agree. 99% of people, if they're armed, are going to be fine. Mm-hmm. but 1% of three and a half, three, 340 million people is still a problem. And the problem's worse when they're armed. Yeah, I would say, yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. In, um, but I would say that the, in reality, the incidence of people, of again, this escalation of something that would be a routine disturbance um, into deadly violence um, is not, if that was going to happen, it actually might've been more likely five, 10, 15 years ago when America was, uh, had, there were actually fewer concealed carry permit holders, but America had more background gun crime, uh, which that background gun crime has decreased. So I, I guess a big part of the difference is between us is again, you know, even though we just talked about the Calvinist aspect, um, <laughs> that, the 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 escalation from normal to deadly um it's just a really 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 rare thing it's a really really rare thing and and um so rare in fact that i think that having more concealed carrier uh, having concealed carriers in your church um uh, all people who've passed a background check, I mean, and I'm presumably, uh, if it's anything like Tennessee, I don't know the laws in Illinois, they probably had to actually go to a class to demonstrate proficiency in the weapon, et cetera. Uh, if the worst happens, you might end up being thankful for that person in the sanctuary because the person who was going to escalate to murder was almost certainly not the concealed carrier who has passed the background check. Um, it's somebody who's troubled and, and possesses a weapon, um, you know, maybe unlawfully, maybe has given off warning signs and nobody had the legal tools to, to do anything about it. And then you would be incredibly thankful. I remember talking to a um, taxi driver in New York and at one of these awful uh, shootings that just happened. And, and I said, he was saying, well, you know, we just need to get rid of guns. And I said, well, if the awful thing happened, an awful thing happened and you're in a place where somebody pulls a gun out, um, wouldn't you want there to be somebody next to you or beside you or near you who could fight back? Wouldn't you want that? And he said, yeah, I, of course I would. Of course I would. And I think when I think of gun ownership in this country um, and increased gun ownership in this country, primarily what we're talking about are people who have passed background checks, who are law abiding and who provide uh, an ability to fight back against foreseeable threats. Um, and I'd rather have those people around me, you know, all other things being equal. I just, I'd rather be one of them. I'd rather have those people around me. And I'd rather be in a society where there are fewer of those threats. Yeah, no, I would be in there. With. And we do live in when there's fewer of those threats than 30 years ago. Thank so, you. David, you, I keep saying this, but you've been more than generous with your time. We went way over. We're not fitting this into one episode. I can tell that already because there's way too much here. you can here. just and, condense this however you want. Well, here's, here's what I really want people to walk away with. 
Uh, you and I have some different views here. Yours are more thoughtful and, and legally founded than mine in some ways. But here's the point. Like I, I've gotten in some of these conversations online before in social media and that never goes well. But to, to have thoughtful engagement with people who are coming from a shared Christian foundation and to think deeply and thoughtfully about this, I hope this models for other people how to have these kinds of conversations rather than just shouting matches, go to your corner and, and fight it out in social media. And I knew when you were going to come on about this topic that you would have really thoughtful, intelligent arguments, <laughs> not just um, sound bites that you got off of some crazy blog somewhere. And I, I'm very grateful for that. Well, you mean I, you, you were not expecting any pry it from my cold, dead hands? No, right? no, I wasn't. And I knew <laughs> okay. you would found it both in good legal and, and moral thinking. So, and that's what... I wish we had more of on all kinds of issues in this country that we're just not seeing modeled in the media or certainly on social media. No, I mean, this is, it's a vital conversation to have because, you know, it really, I'm not saying it's a unique American issue because there are other countries that have uh, widespread gun ownership, but it, it is not, uh, it is not the norm in advanced democracies to have this many guns in private hands and, and, um, you know, it can also make you a little bit nervous, especially as we're seeing a lot of the uh, sort of social fabric around us unraveling. Yeah, and that was a whole even, area I wanted to talk about. We never got to. Yeah, we haven't had a chance to talk about it. And, and there you're seeing some of the, 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 the worst of gun ownership. And you're also seeing at the same time some of the necessity of self-defense. And it is a mess. And, and some of the things that we have to deal with, for example, I long thought that no-knock raids are absolutely incompatible with, um, widespread no-knock raids are incompatible with both castle doctrine, which is something that says a homeowner has no duty to retreat in their own home when, when somebody appears to come in unlawfully. Uh, it's also not really all that compatible with widespread homeowner gun ownership. Uh, and so we've had a lot of awful, awful tragic issues. The Breonna Taylor killing in mm -hmm. Louisville being one of them, where um, that sort of no-knock raid uh, law enforcement culture that has emerged during the war on drugs collides with widespread civilian ownership of guns. And in that circumstance, I think what needs to give is the no-knock raid. Like the, uh, the agents of the state bursting into your door uh, should be, un that should happen only in the most rare of circumstances uh, when human life is in imminent danger. Uh, but yeah, so there, there's a lot of unique issues that arise that require a a very thoughtful and deliberate approach. And unfortunately, I think what's happened is that uh, gun uh, arguments about gun rights have become part of the culture war in the sense that they have become to the different combatants markers of your, uh, they've almost become mar uh, additional markers of who are good and bad people. Right. Rather than I have this policy, this is a complicated public policy issue with competing interests at stake. And here's how I come down on it. It's now, oh, if you're not for universal background checks, you're a bad person. Right. It becomes a tribal marker. And yeah. you're either, you're, you're in my tribe or you're not. And that's how I know who to affirm and who to condemn. And, and Christians are being wrapped up in that just as much as everybody else. And yeah, it, I mean, thinking back to, was it 08 when Obama was running and he was recorded about people clinging to their guns and Bibles and it, you know, set off a whole identity uh, marker for people. And we're still there. And unfortunately, as the fabric unravels, we're going to see uh, more conflict over this. And with 400 million guns floating around, that, that doesn't bode well. <laughs> um, David, thank you. I, I, you've been so, so generous with your time and your thought. And I know you had a long day doing a ton of interviews, but thank you for willing to come back on. Oh, my for pleasure. Jumping in. And I look forward, hopefully in the, in the coming months, we can have you back from time to time to talk about some other issues. No doubt there's going to be a lot happening before and after the election. Ooh, our country's got a lot to live through in the next 60 days. Good. I know. I'm, I'm um, not looking forward to it, to no. be honest. But no. I am grateful there are people like you to help us make sense of some of it. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I tell you what, I mean, I'm, I'm very pessimistic about the state of our social fabric between now and not just November 3rd, but up to a week after the election. I mean, it, it could be days and days after the election before we even know who won. Yeah, there, there was a report that came out from someone who said the worst case scenario would be election night looking like a Trump victory because of people who voted in person, but then the mail-in ballots being counted over the next four or five days to ultimately give the win to Biden. 
and then you've got both sides fighting and uh, contesting the results and we're we're in something worse than a 2000 contested election we're 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 in 2000 without any sort of shared social fabric or um willingness to to abide by legal rulings so it could be a mess i can't even imagine bush v gore now i can't i can't imagine a exact same factual scenario instead of it being bush v gore the case is trump v biden yeah um i can't that that would be so much more explosive in the current environment than it was in 2000. And pick your side in 2000, Gore capitulated, right? He could graciously. have fought, graciously, and he could have fought longer. Some wanted him to, but but that seems completely out of character for Donald Trump. So, <laughs> oh my um, gosh, yes. yeah, I, I hope all these predictions are not true. But yeah. yeah. All right. Well, on that happy note, (laughs) enjoy your evening with your family, hopefully. And uh, I'll let you know when we're going to ultimately put this out. And I don't know how we're going to do it because it's super long, but we may have to do some on on the show and some on a second episode or some for our Patreon subscribers, but we'll figure it out. David, you're fantastic. Thank you again. Thanks for having me. And if you edit it down, just make me smarter. Oh, that won't be possible. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks very much. See ya. Bye. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Phil Vischer Enterprises, that's Phil's company, and Sky Pilot Media, that's Sky's company. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, and more.